Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cabinet Conversations, or welcome back, I should say, to Cabinet Conversations. My name is Erica Scott, and I'm the Artistic Programming Manager at Ford's Theater. If you are joining us for the first time, this is our live series exploring creativity, history, and leadership. You can learn more and explore our past programs by visiting our website at www.fords.org. Today, we have a special co-sponsored cabinet conversation with Mosaic Theater to discuss something that is prevalent in the media right now and prevalent as ever in our history. 67 years ago, a young boy from Chicago took a trip to Mississippi to visit his family that took a horrifying turn. 67 years later, Emmett Till's story is embedded in the fabric of our nation's civil rights story. This past March, the United States Senate passed a bill, Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, making lynching a federal hate crime. With the passing of the bill and the release of the new films and docu-series and plays, Emmett's story is rising again to the surface of our national consciousness, bringing us to a, a crossroads of active history and storytelling. Today, we welcome Aoife Beza, Dr. Hillary and Green, and Luis Lopez to Cabinet Conversations. Welcome to you all. Aoife is an award-winning playwright, director, novelist, and educator. Her literary style and transcendent themes veer from the intimate to the mythic and compel us to re-examine the deeply embedded ideas we attach to race and gender. A 2022 McDowell Fellow, Aoife was a finalist for the 2020 Herb, Herb Alpert Award in theater and for the 2020 Francesca Primus Prize. And in 2018, she was the inaugural humanist in residence at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Honors for the Ballad of Emmett Till include the Edgar Award, the Backstage Garland Award, and fellowships from the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center and Brown University. The Till Trilogy will make its world debut at Mosaic Theater Company in Washington, D.C. This, it's running now, y'all, so go see it. <laughs> It's running until November. Dr. Hillary Green is the James B. Duke Professor of Africana Studies at Davidson College. Her research and teaching interests include the intersections of race, class, and gender in African American history and the American Civil War, Reconstruction, Civil War memory, the US South, 19th century America, and the Black Atlantic. She is currently at work on several projects, including a second book examining how everyday African-Americans remembered and commemorated the Civil War. She is also at work on several pieces exploring the enslaved experience of the University of Alabama and other topics on African-American experience during the long reconstruction era, including the burden of the University of Alabama's hallowed grounds. Her book is, is I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is The Public Historian 42, and it was released in November 2020, so go check her out. <laughs> and finally, Luis Lopez is a federal civil rights attorney who currently serves as the chief of the policy and strategy section in the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. In this position, he oversees the development and execution of legislative, regulatory, and policy proposals, as well as strategic initiatives that support the enforcement of civil rights laws in areas as education, employment, housing, voting, and criminal justice matters. Mr. Lopez also worked in private practice at law firms in both Washington, D.C. and Chicago, as well as at the Washington Post Digital. For eight years, Mr. Lopez served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he taught advanced courses on labor and employment law. He received a JD from Harvard Law School and an LLM in labor and employment law from Georgetown University Law Center. Again, welcome all three of you. We are so, so thrilled to have mm -hmm. you all here on Cabinet Conversations today. 
As a reminder to our viewers, we are taking questions on our social media platforms and we are broadcasting on both YouTube and Facebook for both Ford's Theater and Mosaic Theater. So whichever one you all are watching, welcome. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions and share them. And as we are able to, we will funnel them into questions with our guests. All right, now, but nitty gritty. <laughs> One of the most amazing and important things that we're eager to illuminate in our conversation today is how for every moment in history, there's the facts of what happened, there's the historical memory of what happened, and then, or how we understand the story in our lives and in our community, and then there's the greater storytelling overall of what happened and how that becomes part of the national narrative. All of you, this question is, this first question is for all three. Our audience is joining us from all over, all over the country today, hopefully mm -hmm. all over the world today. So let's begin with the facts. Who was Emmett Till? Uh, Lewis, do you wanna start with that mm -hmm. question? Sure. Um, so as a current government employee, I need to give a caveat, sorry about this. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I work in the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, which helps to enforce the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. The views I'm expressing today are my own and not that of the Department of Justice or the federal government more generally. Um, the tragic story of Emmett Till um, resonates with me personally in a couple, for a couple different reasons. Uh, first, it's a profound statement about the historical and continued stratification in parts of our society and its harmful effects on our daily lives. Whether these hierarchical systems are rooted in public laws or social norms, they seem to reflect a consistent desire to elevate certain groups over others. And while this approach has affected a broad range of people over time, of course, it always tends to subjugate those who are most vulnerable and powerless. Uh, my own family experienced some of this history I'm originally from Mexico, my grandfather emigrated to the United States to find work as a tailor and a musician to support his family. During the 1950s, he spent some of his some time living and working in Chicago, remarkably around the same time and in the same city as Emmett Till. When I was young, my grandfather would tell me stories about different parts of his life. In one story, he told me about going to the movies when he lived in Chicago. He loved film and music, art forms that often move people and tell interesting stories. And I think I inherited that trait from him. Um, when he would go to the movies, where he sat in the theater depended on what he said. He was lighter skinned, and if he just raised his hand with a single finger extended, they'd give him a ticket in the white section. If he had to speak, though, his pronounced accent resulted in him being seated in, quote, the color mm -hmm. section. I tell you this because these exclusionary tactics used at the time of Emmett Till's life are more universal in terms of not only who they affected, but also what the potential consequences of noncompliance could be. In my grandfather's case, his words, perhaps coupled with his color, resulted in being seated in a less desired area of the theater. But for Emmett Till, his words, coupled with his race and color, led to his horrific abduction, torture, and death. Learning about prejudice, inequities, and discrimination in cases like this led me down an intentional course to pursue a career in civil rights, to work for people who are marginalized, hurt, and may find it difficult or impossible to speak for themselves. I think that the, the second way and more fundamental way I think of Emmett Till's story is one about common humanity, both the tragic loss of innocence and the hopeful discovery of strength that one doesn't even realize that they had. The hatred and violence that led to the light and life being untimely snuffed out of this smart and funny 14-year-old boy is beyond horrific and breaks my heart. Mm. And acts of hate like this reverberate through families, communities, and the nation, just like they did with Emmett Till's murder. From hate crimes like this in, the in 1955 to others that continue today, we see people's growing fear that they too may be threatened, attacked, or forced from their homes because of what they look like, who they are, where they worship, or whom they love. But I also like to focus on Emmett Till's brave mother, Mamie, and the strength it took to do what she did in the face of such tragic circumstances. 
Mrs. Till's difficult and courageous decision to have an open casket funeral and to speak openly, honestly, and often about what happened to her son became a touchstone that helped to ignite the civil rights movement. The difference that one human can make is as po powerful as it is personal. And so when I reflect on Emmett Till's story, I also try to think about what I can do, how I can be brave, and where I can contribute in helping make a more positive difference in this world. I would like to follow on that because I think for me, I learned about Emmett Till's story as a young child watching Eyes on the Prize, which still is one of the best documentary series um, that is done on the civil rights movement. And the introduction to hit this 14 year old murder, but also to how white women's lies led to his murder and continue to find no justice, but also a black mother's love. Mm -hmm. in not only refusing to remain silent because the system of race that led to Till's murder also created a system of silence and terror. Mm -hmm. And it needed people to be brave, to be bold, to step away. And his death and innocence, even I was like seven or eight when I saw this, I'm like, he's a child. What did he do to provoke these this white backlash by adults who are supposed to protect, understand. And the fact that they were able to have no justice in that because of racism at the time. And that's why I think about Emmett Till and why I then started to read and I'm reading other 14 year olds, 15 year olds from Muhammad Ali and Moody and others. They were like, that was my, that was, he was my age. And seeing that as a youth and now as a professor, when I teach Till, I teach the fullness of Till. And I teach him and his life the way his mother gave him the talk before he got on that train to board for um, Mississippi. Because my students know the talk, especially my Black men in the classroom. And they're like, no, this is longer history. But also to situate Mamie Till with other strong Black women of the period. And going back to Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mary Church Terrell, and this long history of Black women who fought for young boys to live, to thrive, and to survive. And so Mamie Till's bravery and boldness and continue to speak out. I think naming this bill the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill is a testament to her work and her legacy and others who became bold and brave because of his death and to continue the fight out, but also at the same time how lies and um, Carolyn um, Bryant Milan is still allowed to not have justice. And she knew that she lied in 1955. Mm -hmm. She has testified to that and she has no remorse of what she did. We need to bring justice even for her and to tell the full story so her lies do not continue to stand and to continue to shape because she has no remorse of what she has done. So this is where I see the An Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act as a response to her, as a refusal to understand and let her lies continue to shape the narrative and let Till and Mamie Till Mobley define what is hate crimes and define justice for those past and present who never got justice. Well, following up on those two really eloquent statements, I think that very question, Erica, is what set me on my quest. Mm -hmm. Who was Emmett Till? Um, as a child of the civil rights movement, uh, as Hillary described, when I first encountered uh, an anniversary issue of Jet Magazine that republished the story of his uh, murder, uh, juxtaposing the picture of his living face with the picture of his face and body in the coffin, I was uh, stunned and um, um, uh, as an adolescent, I believe I was around the same age as, uh, as Emmett was when I was look encountering this picture. And um, I could not reconcile the image of torture and pain and cruelty uh, of his death face with the, the glow and the ambition and the joy 
in his living face. And uh, as someone who was going through desegregation myself, I totally identified with Emmett Till, the child. And I found myself even then not feeling uh, just grief, but I missed him. And I said, how can you miss him when you don't even know him? And uh, as I started doing this work as an adult playwright, uh, then my entry point was always to discover who was Emmett Till to satisfy that question that I had when I was an adolescent that same age and to uh, also bring to light the agency and the role of youth in our struggle for liberation and in our resistance movement. Um, yes, Mamie Till Mobley's valiant and courageous act to have an open casket funeral was uh, uh, a gesture that fueled us all and turned her from uh, uh, into a warrior mother and an emblematic mother. But it was also Emmett's gestures in going south and challenging some of the mores that he considered ridiculous. Why can't you look somebody in the eye? Why can't you say goodbye when you walk out of the store? Why can't you whistle at a woman who walks in front of you? Um, challenging the very uh, uh, strictures against black men and black men expressing any individuation or authority or sexuality. Um, and uh, his was playful, but uh, that playfulness and that assumption that he could be an equal person challenging the bound, that was also the, a, 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 a resistant spirit of his own. And uh, I, as someone going through integration and seeing uh, the Little Rock Nine and um, the um, the uh, sit-in movement in Greensboro, South Carolina, uh, Ruby Bridges in uh, North Carolina, even um, uh, the, the young Brown, these were all children. And uh, before Rosa Parks even uh, used to give up her seat, there was a young 16 year old. Uh, I can't remember her name now. I wrote it down. Claudette Cl 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 <laughs> Who earlier in March, before yeah. Emmett's, that had refused to give up her seat. Mm -hmm. But she was what Saida Hartman might, might consider a, a sort of wayward girl and was not exactly the image that the NAACP could put forward as, as, as a symbolic uh, uh, representative. Of, 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 of a movement, mm -hmm. but that spark of resistance came from that 16 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about, and when you look at Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, these are all young people. And so in my exploration of Emmett, I wanted to really explore the agency that mm -hmm. you have played mm -hmm. in our struggle uh, to achieve um, uh, fully, full, respected equality and um, uh, respected humanity. Um, and then uh, I discovered he was just a remarkably extraordinary, ordinary kid who was eccentric and in the, in the, um, in my attempt to capture his life, I was hoping to show the value and the preciousness of every life of all of our children. Yeah. I thank you. Thank you all for the, all of that. Two big things that I took just now was, or three, is how easily and how connected all of your experiences are, all of our experiences are. And Aoife, you you mentioned the grief. How can you grieve for someone that you don't even know? You know, that you, I mean, I too learned about Emmett through the um, docu-series, Eyes on the Prize. And I remember watching it with my mother and she wept 
you know, she was a child when uh, she was like two when the incident happened. But it becomes a part of being black in America. It becomes a or per, even just a person of color. It becomes a part of your story automatically. <laughs> and we feel real feelings for every single loss that we have in this fight for equality. And the, the third thing that I took is children have been at the forefront every single time. And it's amazing to, and I know that um, many of our viewers may be watching with their young children and we have a large up, uptick of the Gen Z's that are now, you know, our audience. And they are loud and in the forefront and they are the youth saying, how dare you still have us in this fight? And that's so powerful when you think about it. Not that there weren't adults, not that there are not adults, but it's such an interesting, when you think about it, Claudette and Emmett and the list goes on and on. Right, and well, and Connor turned his hoses and dogs <laughs> on children. Yep. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, um, and John Lewis, you know, was a young man. You yeah. Know? So um, that energy, that, that uh, fullness of life and that expectation of of the, of acceptance, you know, the shock that you get um, as a young person yeah. confronting this this um, wall of of um, refusal to uh, accept our full, full humanity um, uh, propels a, a reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, you were mentioning Muhammad Ali. There is um, an anecdote. He has an anecdote about uh, when he first learned yeah. mm -hmm. of Emmett's death. He was also 14 years old. His you know, kind of un, untrained resistance uh, caused him to get some of his friends together. They went to the uh, railroad mm -hmm. yard and mm -hmm. overturned, a, derailed a, a, a train yeah. just as an act of, of immediate resistance mm -hmm. and outrage. Uh, that then kind of formed itself later mm -hmm. into the magnificent uh, activist that he became. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, we. Uh, it, one of the reasons I'm excited about the Tilt trilogy coming out now is that we are getting ready to enter into another really perilous time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my hope is that uh, youth will be informed and both activated mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. um, this mythic story. Yeah. It is a mythic yeah. story in that way. And the reason we grieve for him is that, that we all have had mm -hmm. within our experience and within our consciousness, this, um, this pain and loss and, yeah. and terror mm -hmm. in some, some or form or fashion. Uh, it has touched everyone, every mm -hmm. black person. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I want to segue now into talking about the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, um, mm -hmm. the title of our program today. Yeah. And I think that we need to tap into that. Um, Lewis, the act was passed this past March and that literally 67 years after Emmett Till was launched. And I'm noticing one of our questions uh, coming from the audience is, is lynching still prevalent in society? And I think that by you talking about the act and this new law, this new legislation might answer that question. Because <laughs> the reality is yes, <laughs> it's still a thing. <laughs> yeah, sadly, you are correct. Um, before I get into what the act does, I wanna stress that its passage is significant if for no other reason that this federal law has been more than a century in the making. Mm -hmm. Years before Emmett Till yeah. in 1955, there were a whole host of failed efforts to enact federal anti-lynching legislation. Um, as Dr. Green mentioned, um, Ida B. Wells back in 19, 1892, first published Southern Horrors, the lynch law in all its phases, documenting the scourge of lynching in the United States. Since that time, more than 200 anti-lynching laws have been introduced in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, none have passed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, lynching just generally is a form of what can be described more broadly as hate crimes. And those are acts of physical harm or threats based on protected characteristics such as race or color. The first federal hate crimes laws were enacted in 1968. And that legislation was signed by President Johnson. And the law made it a crime to use force or threats of force against people based on their race, color, religion, or national origin because they are engaged in federally protected activities such as public education, employment, jury service, housing, public accommodations. Um, additional laws have been passed to protect against acts of hate. For example, in the 1990s, Congress passed laws to protect against arson and damage to religious property because of the race, color, national origin mm -hmm. of the people associated with that property. But more recent efforts to pass anti-lynching legislation have been stifled. For example, the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act of 2018, introduced mm -hmm. by then Senator Kamala Harris and her Senate colleagues, Cory Booker and Tim Scott, passed the Senate but died in the House. The Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act defied the odds when it finally passed both chambers of mm -hmm. Congress to become law on March 29th, 2022, which leads to sort of the question of what exactly does this act do now? Um, the new law amends existing federal hate crimes law to add new provisions related to lynching. First, it designates lynching as a federal hate crime for the first time in U.S. history. Um, the law defines lynching as a conspiracy to commit a hate crime that results in death or serious bodily injury. Second, the law punishes violations of the new anti-lynching provisions with greater penalties in certain circumstances. For example, it imposes a maximum sentence for convicted perpetrators of 30 years instead of lower sentences for other hate crimes or conspiracy charges. It also applies in a broader range of circumstances as it eliminates the requirement that the government prove intent to interfere with a federally protected right like voting or housing or jury service. All in all, the act will facilitate the prosecution of hate crimes and may also help to deter acts of violence that are motivated by it. But going back to the timing of the passage of the law at this particular moment in time in 2022 and why that is so significant, um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation issues hate crime statistics every year. The statistics released last fall confirmed what many in law enforcement and communities around the country have suspected for years, that hate crimes are on the rise. Mm -hmm. They have increased to their highest level in almost two decades. The majority, over 60%, were motivated by race and ethnicity. And of those, more than half targeted African-Americans. Since 2020, we also saw a steep rise in reported attacks on people of Asian descent due to the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. DOJ's workload reflects responses to this rising tide of hate, which gets to, I think, is this still happening? In the last couple of years, DOJ has charged more than 50 people with federal hate crimes violations and obtained convictions for more than 45 defendants. And let me give you a sense of some of the facts in those cases. Um, DOJ charged a man with hate crime and arson violations for burning a cross in his front yard to threaten and intimidate a black family in Gulfport, Mississippi. And again, mm -hmm. just in the last couple of years. <laughs> DOJ got a guilty plea from a man who traveled to a family dollar store in Citrus Springs, Florida, where he followed a black man into the parking lot, then directed racial slurs at him and physically attacked him, causing multiple injuries to his face and legs. DOJ obtained a six year prison sentence for a man who stabbed a black man 10 to 20 times in the head and chest while screaming racial slurs at him. And DOJ secured a 25 year prison sentence for a woman in Iowa who intentionally used her car to injure a 12 year old boy mm -hmm. who she believed was African or Middle Eastern. And then 30 minutes later drove her car and injured a second Hispanic looking 14 year old girl who she believed was taking over American jobs and homes and shouldn't be in our country. This clearly demonstrates that this type of law and these types of uh, harms are sadly still needed. Mm -hmm. What I think is so interesting about what you just yeah. shared with us, Lewis, is that what I think the national audience thinks about in terms of lynching is being strung up. Mm -hmm. And they they I don't think that the conversation is as as broad as we would hope it is that 
a lynching is is a hate crime full stop <laughs> it doesn't matter how it is ex executed it still counts and i i think that it is fantastic that this law <laughs> now exists in a more firm position to try to safeguard against lives that are young mm -hmm. lives. You just mentioned two that were children. Yeah. And that is uh, <laughs> you, uh, uh, Hillary. Uh, yeah, and I just keep on, <laughs> I keep on thinking about also the rise in hate crimes, but also the use of the symbol of the noose. Mm -hmm. And the noose itself to intimidate um, nooses appearing at works of employment, mm -hmm. including Amazon and other things. So even those symbols of a lynching, the classical sense, expanded out so great. But one of the most direct things where I'm so glad this law came to pass in is after January 6th, because they were, co they were constructing gallows to yeah. actually do a mass lynching. The fact that they were able to do that in a different type of conspiracy, it goes back to the public nature of this. And sometimes the spectacle and public mob mentality. And there's something that we have seen in those last couple of years of that mob mentality, but a willingness to not see people as people, but as someone whose life is disposable and one in which they have no guilt in removing or eliminating life and that i think too having this bill offers a lot more protections and even if it stops a person i'm just hoping it stops a <laughs> rational person at time we're dealing with the irrational yeah and the um but also to giving communities another sense of making a federal crime and having those maximums in there. Because I have a feeling, based on the cases that you mentioned and what I'm looking at, SPLC and EGI and their numbers, mm -hmm. we need that federal protection because the states aren't going to do it. Mississippi refused to indict Carolyn Bryan after they realized she lied. This is not the first time they've been able to indict States aren't going to do this. We need federal protections. And that's why having this as a federal anti-lynching act is so crucial, because that's where we still have the, the few rights on that level in protection. Mm -hmm. um, Hillary, can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about uh, the historical, historical context mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. where Emmett's life and death sits in the larger arc of the civil mm -hmm. rights conversation? Yeah, I see this two arcs, but two different archives, Life Magazine <laughs> and White America, an introduction to um, Emmett Till's story, but also to Jet Magazine and Jet Magazine and its global reach, because Emmett Till was a global event. <laughs> And it's Jet Magazine's coverage of that event that goes to France, it goes to um, England, it goes all the way around the world, including then Soviet Union in this Cold War activism. So when we think about the civil rights movement, we also think about the role of the Cold War in convincing the federal government to make change. But in Jet Magazine version, that was one of their highest selling issues. I think my grandparents still had their copy of it. it was like one of those things you still had in households. Mm -hmm. That was your education because of the segregated schools, those alternate learning, that fed, uh, future pedagogy in there. So that became the entry level for a lot of youth activists who become a part of SNCC, the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Commission and other civil rights lead. And Moody's biography, Coming of Age in Mississippi, really talks about her activation there and then when she went to, goes to college. But white Americans learned about this through Life Magazine. And Life Magazine, when Brian confesses that he does it. <laughs> I think it was Look, Look Magazine. Look, yeah. So, yes. so seeing that, it becomes for some of the uh, white progressives, especially college age students of um, UNC Duke, other campus who become your freedom writers. And they start to realize that there's two Americas. Mm. And that this African-American youth and what happened to him and it also to that there was something going on that wasn't a Southern thing. This was a national thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a way to then get scholars in there. And one of the things I like most about Emmett Till is what happens when these civil rights activists age out. 
John Lewis, young man, <laughs> um, Claiborne Carson, young man. They either became academics and PhDs who wrote those first histories of the civil rights movement. Um, thinking about VP Franklin and his work on the civil rights movement, um, SNCC, the book about SNCC, but also women in the movement with uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and other women. Those activists knew that it wasn't just once they left, they had other skills and that was to teach the next generation because if they didn't write that history, it would not be told. And I think that's why we have a civil rights movement history that we can point to. The intentional collection and telling and centering of Till's story that's in almost every high school textbook, even including the AP US, you do learn about Till. You might not learn about a lot of other people, but you will learn about Emmett Till. College classes to center on him, playwrights and other things. You can do whole courses now on him. And that was because I think the not only to tell the story, but to tell the truthful story based on how this was responded to in the media at the time, that they realized in order to do this, they had to tell it and tell it truthfully and to include everything. So I think what it was is also another response that we know more about civil rights movement, Emmett Till's place in history as one of those early catalysts for the modern day civil rights movement. And then we used to go Till to Rosa Parks and we move forward. But Till is usually centered first and foremost, and it's his murder. And then his funeral is how most civil rights history is taught today in a lot of K through 12 and then college. So Till is getting his due on all levels, not just the academic, but in the classroom. And I think, and then also in museums, including the new Smithsonian Museum in DC and how centering him, he will never be forgotten. And I think that the drive to remember in his age and his loss of innocence is one of the ways why he is centered a lot because what would have happened with an adult till? Mm. And then the four little girls of Birmingham, mm -hmm. how many other young individuals, foot soldiers who became martyrs for the cause mm -hmm. and their age did not prevent their death. Yeah. There's, oh, go ahead. go ahead. There's something also uh, in relation to the till saga in particular that I, you know, for want of a better phrase, called the found poetry of history. Uh, there, there was a nobility to the to that family. When I think of the passing of Queen Elizabeth, you know, and and the the world's grieving, and it's not to uh, take anything from that moment. But uh, as members of a democratic republic, I wondered what what would nobility look like for us? And there's no greater example of that than this family that, you know, uh, uh, rose out of its grief and, and, and put it on display to represent and defend um, uh, uh, the rest of Black America and to bring the story of the true oppression that was going on to the world. Mm -hmm. And then within the, the saga itself, um, I, I often thought, you know, uh, if I were writing a fictional piece, and I wanted to create a character who represented the righteous patriarch of an extended family. I couldn't make up mm -hmm. a more appropriate name than Moses Wright. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emmett Till, Till to go before, we call him the spark of the civil rights movement. It's within his name to prepare the soil, to yeah. make the way for others. Um, the... Uh, Trinity, the three T's in the middle of his name, represented uh, representative of, of of crosses of Calgary of the uh, the Black Liberation theology that would become the the bedrock of the modern civil rights movement. It was so money, the town, which is at the heart of it all, and uh, the fact that his body rose up after three days. He mm. was intended to disappear, mm. but you know that yeah, it is it it is is uh, an actual fact that the body rose up after three days. But as as a poet, I I take that symbolism to to um, uh, to mark and to honor the the uh, the the palpable spirit 
which mm -hmm. was perhaps something else that I felt when I looked at his mm -hmm. photograph mm -hmm. and saw just the life force and the spirit force within this this young man or this uh, adolescent and uh, and uh, that that was emblematic mm -hmm. of his entire family. Uh, the fact that his grand that is his great uncle as a dark skinned black man growing up in Mississippi would then have to testify in an all white courtroom. Uh, it's not coming down from Chicago like mm -hmm. its mother, but is 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 an, an elder living in that mm -hmm. man has lived and figured out how to survive in that man and then has to come to grips with this. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Miss Eva, we lost that last little bit. <laughs> there were so many mythic and dramatic moments that are just embedded in the story. Yeah. That is that is also why it 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 grips us even today. Yeah. yeah. And I keep on thinking too why he's people are so threatened by him. And the fact that his marker is target practice for white Mississippians, largely college students, and I'm not going to name the institution that sends its fraternities over there, but they do. <laughs> he still is, his symbolism cannot be snuffed out. Yeah. His age, his youth, all of that. And I think, too, the fact that that sign keeps on getting replaced also is a testament, like, no, he is representative of a very particular type of America, and we will defend this right. To yeah. have his story told. If I could add, because I mean, we've been talking about sort of the image and the photo and this uh, tying it back to the Emmett Till Anti Lynching Act, um, which was introduced by Illinois Representative Bobby Rush. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rush says he was personally motivated to bring the bill because when he was eight years old, his mother put a photograph of Emmett Till's brutalized body found in Jet Magazine on the living room coffee table. Mm -hmm. uh, the chilling image shaped his consciousness as a black man in America mm -hmm. and changed the course of his life. And so he, in introducing this bill, he, it was a, a very personally motivated uh, uh, action act for him. And so when the House passed the bill in February 2020, um, initially it didn't pass because the Senate was considering the bill during the nationwide protest uh, and civil unrest over George mm -hmm. Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. and Senator Rand Paul at that time had blocked the bill from passage, um, expressing concern that the bill needed to be more limited to address more serious crimes. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so Representative Rush reintroduced the bill the next Congress, adding a serious bodily injury standard. But you can see from the cases that we're talking about, hate crimes cover a broad range of issues. So um, this time the bill passed in the House and the Senate, and then was signed by President Biden on March 29th. Could you, Lewis, could you give us a little bit of just like, like we've all, I hope, have seen like Schoolhouse Rock, I'm just a build, like that's, that's some of us, <laughs> some of us, that's our upbringing, <laughs> you know, but could you explain a little bit about like what the process is to get a bill to the, to the point of passing? Is that something that we can educate our audiences on right now? Sure, sure. I'll do my best to do a brief uh, uh, <laughs> intro into that. Um, so um, bills get introduced by members of Congress, and to have any chance of success, they need bipartisan support from co-sponsors on both sides of the aisle. Um, the bill then gets sent to a committee of jurisdiction uh, for review, which may lead to markups of the bill or hearings on the bills. Um, other members of Congress can propose amendments that will then need to be discussed and agencies like the Department of Justice um, can, who are subject matter experts in these in particular areas um, related to a particular bill, can usually get asked to provide technical assistance, which can prompt tweaks in bills and then further debate and compromise. Um, bills fortunate enough to gain traction will need to go through the process I've described in both the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and then work out conflicts or inconsistencies between the two bills. If either chamber fails to act during the congressional session that they're in, the bill dies, and then it has to be in, in, introduced the following session. And that's sort of what happened with the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. And then the process starts over again. Mm -hmm. um, for hot button or polarizing issues, um, including some criminal justice matters, this legislative process that I've described can be even more daunting. Um, I explained the 
the process in the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, but there is another significant piece of hate crimes legislation that passed earlier. And it's also instructive to look at sort of what this process is like. Um, and that's the Matthew Shepard James Byrd yeah. Jr. Act, mm -hmm. signed by President Obama in 2009 and served as a belated response to the murders of Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr., which had occurred more than 10 years earlier in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, Shepard was a student in Laramie, Wyoming, who was tortured and murdered for being gay. And Byrd was a black man who was tied to a truck yeah. by three white supremacists, dragged behind it and decapitated in Jasper, Texas. While the perpetrators were convicted of crimes, there were no applicable hate crimes. At the time, Wyoming did not, or Wyoming's law didn't recognize um, sexual orientation as a protected characteristic, and Texas had no hate crimes law at all. Um, the Shepard Bird Law is significant because it was the first statute to allow prosecution of federal hate crimes motiv motivated by a victim's actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. The law also enhanced the legal toolkit available to federal prosecutors uh, to bring these types of cases and the ability of federal law enforcement to work more closely with state and local partners on these efforts, which is a critical key being able to be successful in these cases. I'm really glad that you brought up that law and yeah. Matthew um, and Mr. Bird to the conversation because um, Ford's actually has a really good relationship with the Shepherds. We did the Laramie mm. project. Um, and we recently just had them on a cabinet conversation during Pride Month to to you know bring Matthew's story back into the forefront. And I, what is so important about what you just did by bringing him and that bill into this conversation is show that it's not just a mm -hmm. color thing. Mm -hmm. It's it's not ever just yeah. a color thing. It's hate, and hate exceeds color and mm -hmm. gender and I think that's so important and it's wonderful to know that we have these bills in place and these laws in place. Mm -hmm. Now how they practice and are enforced, mm -hmm. we got work on, but we yeah. have them in place. And that's so, mm -hmm. it's comforting to know. It, mm -hmm. it, I'm not gonna say that it provides justice in the way that I think that we all need it, but it's comforting to know that we have grounds to stand on. I, and I would just add that, you know, uh, we had uh, the Department of Justice uh, held, hosted a virtual conference called Confronting Hate Strategies mm -hmm. for Prevention, Accountability and Justice last fall. I was the MC of that program and we had more than a thousand community leaders, advocates, law enforcement yeah. officials and government colleagues attend. We heard from the Attorney General, the Assistant mm -hmm. Attorney General for Civil Rights, the FBI, U.S. attorneys from around the country, and perhaps most importantly, we heard from survivors mm. of hate crimes and violence. And we also had the parents of Matthew Shepard, and we have the sister um, of James Byrd Jr. there, and it was a fantastic event. And these types of discussions, I think, do show the universality and, the, and how we're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. The problems are interconnected and the solutions will also have to be interconnected. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want to now talk about Aoife's shows. Yes. Um, you're, you mentioned in the first question mm -hmm. what drew you to, call, to write these, but I just want to like, like full disclosure for the audience, y'all. She, the shows are called The Ballad of Emmett Till, That Summer in Sumner, and Benevolent. And even in the way that you have entitled these trilogies, you could have wrote one show that covered all of these, but you have given us a trilogy and you have added more to the conversation. And being that this program is to talk about this crossroads of where history and storytelling come, I think having you here, Aoife, is, is you are the embodiment of that crossroads. And so I just, what, why didn't you write this one? Like, what made you say, okay, I have this is a larger story and I have to tell it in three parts? Well, you, you answered <laughs> the question for me. Uh, <laughs> I started it really as a one act, mm -hmm. and it uh, was uh, essentially um, the first part of the ballad where um, uh, Emmett or Bobo, as his mother called him, um, uh, wants to go off on a trip to Mississippi, you know, he gets no, 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 no. And he finally wears her down and gets to go. And it ended at the train station where he says, you know, um, 
uh, I return to you a man. Don't forget to fix my bike, you know. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. then uh, after I finished that part, I said, well, you know, then let him go on. You know, I let it was a lovely cryptic one act where you could then imagine the world mm-hmm. that was the, the torture that was or the tragedy that was going to befall him. But I said, do you still need to tell this? You need to tell us, you need to find out because um, uh, I still didn't have a, a sense of who he was, which was my original quest. Mm-hmm. So then I took him on that seven day journey and um, uh, and also took myself on a research journey, doing a lot of primary research, mm-hmm. talking to his cousins, talking to uh, former classmates, mm-hmm. talking to people who were his age, both in Chicago and Mississippi at the time, uh, uh, interviewing the numerous scholars who have worked on either civil rights uh, narratives or um, the Till saga in particular. And um, uh, then I wrote this big (laughs) social drama that tried to do everything. And the trial got about 15 minutes, you know, because you know, it was so full. And um, a colleague of mine, Ben Bradley, uh, who has since passed on, had a 99 seat theater in Los Angeles. He said, I really want to do the play, but, you know, it's got 15 actors. We got 99 seats, you know, <laughs> Can you condense it. So as a favor to Ben, I, I uh, started to look at it to see how I could could condense the cast. Mm-hmm. I said, well, if I just do Emmett's story, then I have a more distilled play and uh, a more focused play. And uh, I can do it with six actors. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that uh, circulated for um, uh, quite a few years at many regional theaters very successfully. But I was still distressed that I had left some uh, elements on the cutting floor, particularly Mm -hmm. the trial and and Moe's right and Mamie's uh, trials as witnesses um, in that um, uh, event. And the the role of of ordinary people who were courageous courageous enough to come forward, uh, the sharecroppers, Amanda Bradley, from uh, uh, an adjacent county. Um, and uh, so I said, okay, let's do another play. Let's, let's focus. And that mm-hmm. allowed that, that part of this epic saga to breathe. And um, I also then, as, as both uh, Lewis and Hillary were mentioning, the, the role of, of the press uh, in uh, bringing this story to the fore and bringing the story of of black resistance into mainstream America, uh, I was then able to uh, do the story of four reporters who were coming down from Jet mm-hmm. to cover the story and tell their their uh, role in this um, uh, epic event as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it became just a much uh, richer mm-hmm. experiment and experience of discovery when I could go behind the scenes mm-hmm. and not just do the trial lawyers as, you know, their their questions in, uh, in, in the trial uh, of the witnesses, but go behind the scenes to, you know, kind of extrapolate what their machinations and thinking must have been mm. to then go into the courtroom. So it uh, it became a much more profound drama after that. Mm. And then uh, I still had, as Hillary was mentioning, this 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 nagging leftover issue of Carolyn Bryant mm. and uh, what she is like the last living. Um, uh, participant or character, main character in this saga. And um, so uh, I had one monologue that was from the original 
uh, play. And then I decided to really do an interrogation since she was never actually interrogated in the courtroom and uh, uh, never really adequately interrogated by any of the, um, the kind of contemporary uh, mm -hmm. recasting of her, of her um, tale. Um, so I decided to, in my own way as a dramatist, blend the primary, use her own words to interrogate mm -hmm. uh, and um, let the audience uh, be the jury on how yeah. successful I was in that. <laughs> it's almost like you've given us our own little, yeah, like imagined piece of justice. You know, like these are the questions that we will never be able to ask her. This right. is the, the the answers that we will never get from her, and right. given them to us, right, as a then, sense of peace. Almost. Yeah, but then I didn't want to create you know, um, uh, to create a white centrality again. Yeah. So to balance her story, uh, which is the first act of benevolence, I, I also wanted to um, tell the story of a young black couple uh, mm. who uh, got swept up in um, the tragedy of Emmett Till. And that that is this the story of Clinton and Beulah Milton. Yeah. Um, uh, that is the act act two of benevolence. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I essentially look at the the impact in the Delta, uh, looking at a white couple that is Carolyn Bryant and her husband, and then looking at a black couple, Clinton and Beulah mm -hmm. Milton, and you know to kind of demonstrate that this pathology of of racial hatred and terror uh, distorts everyone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, makes makes the uh, the quest for love almost a, an impossible venture. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you have added your take to the conversation and y'all go see it. It's at Mosaic. I'm going to plug it again before we're done today. <laughs> until the 20th, so go get your ticket. <laughs> Man, I might have to fly up from North Carolina to see Come this on. one. Cause <laughs> I would love for you, Hillary, I would love for you to do it because, you know, you touched on so many points mm -hmm. that, you know, um, I, I try to uh, elucidate. Um, um, but, you know, it's it's uh, truly this this is a fascinating mm -hmm. and a human uh, human drama. And, and if, if anything... Um, the Till Saga is about American civil rights, but it's also about um, this this impasse we are as human beings that we cannot seem to get beyond this this need to create an other and mm -hmm. to to have a quest for dominance over the other using the emotions of hate and fear. Uh, yeah. tactics of terror to do that. And this is where I think your work is so powerful. Like I, as a historian, then we have the legal side, the act and this, this is how you create the empathy and understanding to help push beyond this impasse. And we need the arts. We need the arts because yes. as a historian, I can do it's, we need multiple storytelling and efficient telling. And I, I'm seeing a thing about one of the Q and a questions about why it has not been passed. Yeah. As a nation, we haven't dealt with race or slavery in its aftermath. We are used to subjugation of other until we are able to see people and create a seat at the table so people can come and have those hard conversations. We'll mm -hmm. never get past this impasse. And I think now, sadly, that takes the deaths of Charleston and um, Breonna Taylor and others, plus a massive pandemic to build that empathy. So right now I'm just ready for whoever, however people come to this and come to hearing about Emmett Till, whether it's a film, a documentary, that we can start having these conversations, how we can then move beyond where we are now. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that, Hillary, <laughs> because it's so, it's, that's the point of this conversation is we are all from different backgrounds. We are all representing different areas that keep the 
nation moving, being that you know, we have Lewis who is representing the law and the government, you Hillary as a historian, Ifa, you as a playwright and artist. We need each other to yes. get things mm -hmm. done. We there's no silo when you think about it. We have to lean on each other to get to make change. Um, I wanna I'm keeping you guys a little bit over and I'm sorry, but this is <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, but I wanna I wanna ask two questions because we um, have several questions that I'm seeing across the chats that all talk about the mothers. And we mentioned mm -hmm. the mothers before, and we've mentioned other women who have been fighting this, this um, civil injustice fight, uh, almost unnamed mostly, you know, but who have the bravery of an Ida, who have the bravery of a Mamie. Um, Lewis, can you tell us what the significance is about naming it after Emmett now, instead of just calling it an anti-lynching act? I think everything that we've we've been talking about um, is is why. I mean, he is the uh, to use Efa's words, nobility in this area, and so I I couldn't think of another name for this act um, except for Emmett Till, um, and you know I I do think that. We spend a little bit of time talking about Carolyn Bryant and, and, you know, I think we're all a little unsatisfied with what the current state of affairs is. And we, we can envision as the play does what might happen in those circumstances. And um, I think it's a very uh, personal issue. I think there's a, um, there is uh, and will remain sort of this dissatisfaction with this particular case in this particular circumstances. And so what I do think is that we can look forward and hopefully um, avoid these things from happening again, bring justice to the ones that can happen. Um, and I will say that there is also at the Department of Justice a cold case initiative. Yeah. You know how many people are familiar with that, but it is an opportunity to look at other cases like this. Um, and there is another law for those of you who don't know called the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Crime, yeah. Civil Rights Crime Act that was passed in 2008 that authorizes the Department of Justice, the FBI, the Civil Rights Division, mm -hmm. U.S. Attorney's Office. And we partnered with the NAACP, the Southern mm -hmm. Poverty Law Center, the National mm -hmm. Urban League to identify these types of cases and mm -hmm. elicit help to try to resolve more of these types of cases to the extent we can. The older the cases are, of course, the more difficult it is mm -hmm. to, uh, to bring justice, to interview people who have knowledge about those types mm -hmm. of events. But we're still, at the department committed to doing this work and resources. Um, so if folks have information about any of those cases is an opportunity for us to, to sort of keep the work of Emmett Till alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Hillary, can you talk about other women who have been involved in this history and trying to get us to what is now the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act? Yeah, I even think about this as Mamie Till establishing a template for other mothers and wives. And I'm most specifically, not just mother or children, I'm thinking about Coretta Scott King, mm -hmm. as well as uh, Malcolm X's widow, mm -hmm. um, and what they were able to do, but also too, when we get to, um, oh gosh, I, I'm blanking out his name, young man, a hoodie in Florida. Trayvon, Trayvon, Trayvon Martin. Trayvon Martin, his mother, but also other mothers who've then come out to the fore and partner with Black Lives Matter, but also make sure that their children and their loved ones got the history there. And oftentimes, I remember, I forget what interview I saw, they mentioned Mamie Till, Mamie Till mm. Obley. She established a template, sadly, because we know these mothers. I just think about how many other people died during the civil rights movement and since, whose names we don't know. Mm -hmm. And thinking about that community of mothers that were now more visible with social media, people actually bringing them to the conversation that were able to know more names about who goes unnamed, but what solace they could do by reading these other histories of what uh, Mamie Till and others women of the civil rights era did. And there's a really good book about the three mothers, including um, King's own mother who gets his ass. Like it's just so many death, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was centered around women 
and women who wanted to make sure that story got told and got told to generations. And so for me, the mothers and keeping these stories alive and keeping it across the board is that unsung heroes and heroines of the story as well. Yeah. We had, oh, go ahead. Uh, we had a um, performance of, of the ballad last week where a group um, of, of DC-based group, Mothers mm -hmm. Against Violence, attended uh, and par participated in the um, Reflections um, panel conversation after. And all of them had lost their children mm -hmm. to gun violence and or some form of physical violence and um, be it at the hands of the police or uh, uh, by private uh, assailants. And I, when I learned that they were there, I was just so anxious about, you know, how will they receive this work? And uh, uh, the two women who spoke in the panel said, were so gratified that this was a way for them mm -hmm. to uh, acknowledge to see in in the story of Emmett um, the uh, the kind of communal grief, mm -hmm. grief as protest, mm -hmm. and it it was buoying. And then when you talk about that human moment, mm -hmm. each of them said that there was one line in the play where uh, um, I, I think it's Emmett who said, "Just one moment, you know, if they could have had just one moment." just one more day with their child. And it was such a profoundly moving uh, collective embracing of them and, and the heightening of their stories. And they each carried with them a picture, a picture of their, of their child, be it, you know, a seven year old or 30, some of, some of these uh, story, some of these deaths happen, happening 30 years ago some happening you know, six months ago. Mm -hmm. And it was just, a, I'm tearing up now, but it was just such a profound moment mm -hmm. for me to um, uh, recognize you know, how important it is for us to get the stories right, to get the laws right, to get the mm -hmm. history right, uh, yeah. because these are really sacred lives. These are precious, sacred yeah. stories that have uh, really, uh, uh, if, if Emmett's, if bringing these plays to life at all impresses upon people, how much this has been a toll mm. in the history of our people mm. uh, and mm. how much it thus needs to be addressed. Yeah. 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 It, is, it is a tragedy that we still have mothers today who have to stand where Mamie stood, you know, and it's it's wonderful that you have given them this piece. It's almost cathartic, you know, it's almost uh, mm -hmm. that group exhale, like I'm not alone. Yes. There's a club I never wanted to join, but at least I'm not alone, you know. Mm -hmm. It's powerful, it's powerful. Um, they gave us our five minutes, so I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> Already <laughs> <surprised> <laughs> but I just I want to I'm gonna I have one more question mm -hmm. that I want to ask all three of you all you know mm -hmm. it is it is exciting as as heartbreaking as the context is it is still extremely exciting that we are sitting here now in this conversation mm -hmm. and actively making history that is something that I don't think we all think about in the greater scheme of things. This isn't something that happened almost 70 years ago. This is something that started 70 years ago. But the reality is it started long before Emmett was even a thought, before Mamie was even a thought. Um, and each of you are currently actively engaged in the work that keeps the conversation alive, that keeps the stories alive that keeps those people, because at the end of the day, they were people first, mm -hmm. they mattered. And 
I just want to know from each of you all, what are some ways that you think our audience or that we as this collective can continue to keep the story alive, to get involved, to get active, to, you know, cause a ruckus, as, mm-hmm. as we should be saying. What are what are some ways that you all think that could happen? I, I say this all the time to my students. Everyone has their talent. Use your talents for good. Yeah. And so for me, tweet out Black History Month facts. Educate, because if we don't teach this, and this is why we're attacking schools and libraries, we need to keep these stories alive. One tweet a day is what you can do now. And then as you l- learn and develop your talents, you can add to it. But keep your eyes on the collective good and that ordinary people did extraordinary things. And you can will be a change maker if you remember that. Mm. And I would say um, learn more about how to identify and report hate crimes. Everyone can do their part. The DOD. D- Jay, the Department of Justice has a hate crimes website. I think that Erica may put the link into the chat, um, but there's a ton of resources on there about hate crimes, including action items for everyone. You can work with your state and local law enforcement to understand the extent of hate crimes happening in your state or in your local area. You can identify community and faith-based groups to interact with law enforcement for victims, um, because those are the groups that victims of hate often go to first is their community and their, their churches and their mosques. Um, and then invite law enforcement to discuss hate crimes and how to prevent them at local schools. The majority of hate crimes are committed by people under 30 and 17% of those under 18 years of age. So um, schools are, um, as Dr. Green said, where, where we should also be having these discussions. And then the other thing I would say as I turn it over to Aoife is go see plays like the Till Trilogy. You will be amazed. So, Thank you. Thank you for that, Lewis. Um, Frederick, I I took a cue from Frederick Douglass, who was talking about the anti-slavery narratives and how important they were to changing the conversation and changing uh, yeah, and and pushing the nation forward. And he had a phrase that that these stories were important. It was important for us to tell them so that we would change the national memory. Mm-hmm. And uh, so whether it's sitting around the family table or uh, talking with your friends, be conscious of not only our past, but our present. We have to tell our stories. Hip hop is only, uh, they, they are the anti-slavery narratives of our time. They are telling our story as we see it, as they live it with you know, some of the most brilliant uh, uh, reinvention of, of language and rhythm and the synthesis of, of the two uh, uh, using you know, our, our ancient music tracks, you know, sampling from history, which is all historians do. Um, So taking that energy, continue to use that energy. It is such a, um, it's, it's such a buoying uh, new art form to watch because it represents the strength and, and creativity and, and the brilliance of our invention of tools of resistance uh, as we go and tools of, of, of uh, persistent, you know, self advocacy. Yeah. And uh, uh, find your, find your public square, be it a theater, mm-hmm. be it uh, the youth, the youth section of the NAACP, uh, find your area of, of comfort to get to get involved, mm. to make yourself heard, to make your presence felt. And uh, uh, though we are a flawed system, use every tool of the system, including voting, particularly as we are going into this cycle. Um, and um, uh, as as a member of an of a medium that employs actors, you know, get active, activate yourself. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I don't want this to end, but <laughs> <you do have. laughs> this has been just an honor to host. And thank you, Eva. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Hillary. My heart is full because this was truly, truly more amazing than I think I even could have planned for. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, To our audience, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation today. Uh, We will continue to monitor and respond to comments on the socials that we weren't able to get to during the live. Thank you to all who did submit questions. Uh, If you are interested in Aoife's plays, the trilogy, the Till trilogy, it is now playing at Mosaic Theater. That's at Atlas on 8th Street, y'all. Go see it. <laughs> and it's playing until November 20th. You can find more information about Mosaic and Aoife's shows at mosaictheater.org slash Till Trilogy. Until next time, thank you all. Good night. <laughs> nice to meet all of you. Nice to meet all of you.